Hey folks, welcome back to the Traders for a Cause podcast. My guest this week is one of my favorite human beings. His name is <laughs> Phil. He's uh, one of the one of the best day traders that I know of and uh, a great supporter of the charity. Phil, welcome to the Traders for a Cause podcast. How you doing? Back. I'm doing well. Thank you for that intro. That was, that was nice of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, I, I knew as soon as I started this thing that you were going to be on my target list right away as yep. one of the best guests that we'll have. So, and, well, and thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm always excited to do interviews with you guys, and I love Traders for Cause. It's probably my favorite charity. That's lovely. Well, thank you for the compliment. So, uh, let's talk about what's going on. How was your 2020? I guess that's a good way, to, good place to start. Um, you know, 2020 was just incredible. I, you know, I, I don't even know. You know, words can't describe you know, the market in 2020 and the environment that we have, the setups that we have, you know, usually as a trader, you look for, you know, one or two or three great setups a month, right? And in 2020, it was just weekly, if not daily. I mean, it was almost every day a monster setup would would provide itself or if not every week. And no matter whether you were a long bias, long bias trader, short bias trader, option trader, the opportunities were there, you know, throughout the whole year. So um, financially, it was my best year ever. I more than doubled my um, previous, you know, best year. Holy cow. Which I never thought would happen. And um, I'm just super, you know, super grateful for the opportunities. And it, it's kind of sad because, you know, 2020 was a year of COVID and everybody was struggling and, and hurting. Um, but as far as the trading environment and the setups, it was just, you know, absolutely incredible. So super grateful and happy. It, it seems to be the uh, the consensus among most of the traders that I've spoken with. Yeah, um, yeah, and I'm 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 really grateful that I was at a place where I am experience wise to to hit that mark, right? Um, because again, if I was a newbie trading, you know, in my second year or third year, you can't really take full advantage of those opportunities. But now, you know, I've been trading 15 years, luckily, so I kind of had some experience under my belt where you see those opportunities and you're just prepared to nail them day after day after day. And it was, um, you know, you were kind of like, it was almost like a dream. You, you think you're going to wake up. When is it going to end? When are you going to wake up and your gap scanner isn't going to have multiple 500% runners, right? And it's right. Just, just every day, all the time. Um, so, you know, I'll, I look back at 2020 and, you know, so far 2021 has been, you know, very similar. Sure. Um, and, you know, you just kind of keep playing until the party finally ends, which, you know, I, you have no idea when that'll happen, right? Yeah, uh, but no complaints at all. Now, fortunately, you you, uh, you do really well for quite a while, and then you can kind of coast when you need to and push right. back a little bit and right. take what the market gives you. Right? Isn't that the mantra? Abs absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt. And you know, again, my trading style and what I really like to do in the past was trade the mornings where you know the volatility's high and the, and and you know the setups are kind of easier in the mornings, then take off the rest of the day. And you know, one unfortunate thing was 2020 almost didn't allow that. You know, you had to work, you know, full days because the opportunities are there. And it's like, yeah, poor me, I have to put in full days. But it did get exhausting, <laughs> you know, right? It did get exhausting because training is, it's mental. And there's times where even though my financial is my best year, there's still a lot of volatility. There's still a lot of ups and downs. And there's a lot of manipulation. And, um, and, and there's a lot of stress. I mean, there's a ton of stress that goes along with day trading, even though, some people make it look easy and some people talk that it's super easy, but there's a lot of stress that goes along with it. So it does become exhausting day after day, week after week, month after month when, you know, you're going nonstop and, and your brain, you know, even though, you know, you don't need the money, but your brain is telling you, Hey, these setups are here. You better trade them. You know, you got to trade them. What else <laughs> are you going to do? So it hasn't really given a break lately, but um, I'm sure it will at some point. You got Absolutely. the weekends, right? <laughs> sure. Well, trading, I think, is one of those uh, unusual career ventures in which, you know, there is no project completion. You know, at the end of the day, right. Right. you're back at it and it's the same thing, exactly. you know, and, and it's just going to keep it's just going to keep feeding you. And that can be very mentally exhausting. It is. You know? it, it is. And it becomes a mental cycle of, um, I'm not saying wanting more, but again, when you see the opportunities and you know, hey, if I trade tomorrow, I'm going to make this much. If I trade the next day, I'm going to make this much. Even though, yeah, you don't need the money and maybe you just donate the money or whatever you do, but it becomes in your head where, well, I need to trade, right? Because the setups are there. What else am I going to do? So, um, you know, it can be kind of taxing where now my weekends are, I'm 
fully unplugged and I really enjoy three day weekends whenever we get them or a market holiday. We actually have one coming up, you know, this, this week for good Friday, but, and I enjoy those way more, but yeah, it's, you know, with the market, the way it is, it's definitely been harder to unplug just from all the opportunities that are out there. Now, do you, when, when you go away on a trip or on vacation, are you usually cash liquid or do you have? Nope. I carry my laptop anywhere I go. You know, the thing <laughs> is now that I'm an options trader, I'll always have 20 to 30 positions on where you don't specifically have to trade, but you got to monitor, right? You right. have to monitor, yes. open it up, see what's going on. And then again, even if I'm traveling, I love to trade the first one to two hours of the day and then, you know, really call it quits if I can. Um, no doubt about it. But no, I my brain is fully wired with the market. I have to take my laptop no matter where we go. So I've never, I haven't not traded an open, I mean, I don't even know, 15 years ever since I started. I have to. Haven't missed one. But I'm, you know, I'm more so now. If 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 I have the opportunity to take off early, you know, I try to. Um, there just hasn't been a ton of opportunity to go lately. Nice. Did you did you feel that as the 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 market changed and evolved last year, you know, after the crash? Right. Did you feel that your experience was more of a liability than a blessing? Or I know you kind of said that it helped you, but I've right. heard kind of like the opposite, like things that you knew to be true before were? Well, you had to adjust quickly. That's something I really learned. You know, the, the biggest adjustment that I've, so no, to answer your question, no, I think my experience helped, no doubt about it, but you had to adjust and you had to adapt. And the biggest thing that I adjusted and adapted to early, you know, right after the market crash, I'm gonna say last April or May, was that swing trading for me was done. Short, holding short overnight was done where you're seeing these runners go you know, two, 300% a day, the next day, they, you know, they might be up after hours, 100%. Um, so my trading adapted and changed pretty quickly, but I'm super, you know, grateful that I had the experience that I did. But, but yeah, the market in general was way different. The trading environment's way different. Um, for the fact that, you know, you were seeing these chat rooms, I think a lot of people staying at home, right? People sure. staying home, working from home, you had stimulus money coming in, and then you had chat rooms with, thousands of subscribers, maybe even putting out a YouTube, um, you know, free pre-market YouTube uh, preview with 10,000 subscribers saying, this is what I'm going to buy today. And this is what I'm going to buy here. And then, you know, moving stocks like crazy. And then you get algorithms to jump on them too, or, you know, algorithms or hedge funds, whatever they are uh, to jump up and, and, you know, manipulate these names too. Um, so the environment is way different and, and you know, much different in 2020, but, you know, I'm, I'm still grateful. Definitely. You know that I had the experience that I did under my belt. Well, I but think that's the thing about trading in general is you have to adapt. You always have to adapt because the markets are ever changing, and you know you gotta you gotta change with them, or you know <laughs> you get wiped out. So. Well, it's been a while since I was at a desk, but I will say that even when I pushed back, which was a couple of years ago, that borrow fees were getting out of control. Right. So I'm assuming that changing your strategy to avoid overnight shorts is probably right. saving you quite a bit in borrow fees, no? An enormous amount. So in the last several years, I've had a 2020 and my borrow fees, so locate fees and short interest totaled around 20% of my net income, uh, which I was fine because there are times where I was swinging stocks, you know, that were charging, you know, 500% a night, 600%. I'm going to swing them a couple weeks, right? Because that was my strategy. I mean, that's sure. what worked. So in 2020 and now even in 2021, you know, shorting overnight is just so incredibly dangerous. So you don't, you know, I just don't do it. Um, and a lot of the things that we've seen run recently have been higher float stocks, right? Stocks with, you know, 50 million shares, let's say 100 million shares, let's say. So, you know, they could be easy to borrow or you're not even paying anything. So when I looked, and I haven't looked at borrow fees lately, but in like, I think November and December of 2020, my hard to borrow fees and short interest were sort of like 1% of my income, which is I mean, lowest it's ever been. So <laughs> that's better. yeah, you don't have the stress of holding positions overnight and you're saving an incredible amount of money on borrow. So um, I loved it, I, it's been great. You know, that's I, the I don't most... mind in the new environment. It's the, definitely the most uh, stressful part of of trading for me back in the day was those overnights because yeah. you know you're holding something especially I guess back in the day when people would trade more much more illiquid stocks right you have a big position and if it starts to run pre market you have your hands are tied I mean you can't get out of it you right. know depending on the size of your position that that is just very anxiety provoking <laughs> oh it is yeah absolutely and you're paying these fees no matter what and right. 
the short interest, you know, the, the fees are disrupt because you pay to locate and then you pay short interest and the short interest can be, you know, I've paid upwards of a thousand percent a night of short interest. I don't even know how that's legal. I really don't know how that's legal to charge what some of these guys charge. Um, but, you know, now we're seeing, you know, like I said, we're seeing a lot higher float stocks run, which is nicer. Right. And the lower float stocks, it's just almost suicide to hold them overnight. So I don't even, I don't do it. I mean, this market environment, I don't do it at all. I was going to say, if the, if the, the big ones are, uh, if the big ones are running, why, why trade the low float? Exactly. <laughs> no exactly. need. Yeah, yeah. Much less stress, anxiety. And you can trade them intraday, right? You don't have to hold them overnight. Right. Right. So, and that's the thing, at four o'clock when the market's done, you don't have to be looking at your phone after hours, where are the quotes, where am I at? Oh, I got to get back, <laughs> box my shares, you know, that, that's done. Right. So, it's kind of nice. That is nice, man. That that must be a, a big difference from what the it way is. it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit, I, I think that our audience would really appreciate like understanding uh, an experienced trader's process. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about how you approach the day and we can start at the close and how you prepare, uh, you know, on the day for the following day and take us right. up through the open. Like, how do you go through your watch list? How do you determine what you're going to trade? How do you approach that? So really at the end of the day, I don't do much. I kind of wind down my day and I don't think about the next day really that often. So, you know, I'll start in the morning, uh, the morning of the market. I'm usually up, um, two, two hours before the open, at least sometimes two and a half hours. You know, I usually look for the, the, the biggest gap of the day, go through the news. You know, what what is the news of these stocks? What are they putting out? And then I'll do, you know, check the float, um, read through the filings, and I'll immediately look at and see, you know, has this company put out this PR before? I always put a, pull up a chart of the stock, pull up a yearly chart and see how it trades. You know, we'll see a lot of times some companies put out you know, a PR every three to four months and the stock trades the exact same way. Opens and, and, and goes straight down, opens and goes straight down, opens and goes straight down. Um, we see other times stock, you know, a lot of these stocks are promotion companies, right? I mean, they're, they're garbage companies, they're small. They love to put out PRs to, you know, raise money, do whatever they're gonna do. Um, and we've seen stocks before that have, you know, multiple times where algorithms will run them. You know, they'll go from zero volume up to a couple hundred million shares a day and the stock will run Two, three, four hundred percent. You know, stock like that, I'm pretty cautious on. Say, hey, this happened in the past. Past, you know, uh, you know, is, you know, can give you a fairly accurate reading of what may happen in the future of how this stock will trade. So, I get my watch list together, two to three stocks max. Sometimes, you know, rarely four to five. Look for borrows. Try to get the cheapest borrows I have, and I try to just set my game plan for you know, how I think that stock could trade the day or where I think I may want to enter an exit. But again, even now with pre-markets being, you know, pre-markets are volatile. So I'm not doing a lot of trading pre-market or post-market. I'm really waiting for the open. And a lot of times now I'm even waiting for the first 15 to 30 minutes to see how's the stock going to trade right off the bat. You know, if I, if I start a trade in the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's usually pretty small size just to give it some room. Because again, we've seen, um, I forgot the ticker, was it EYES maybe a month ago? Um, you know, there's so many, so many tickers, I can't even remember them. But that just, you know, they look dead pre-market and then all of a sudden the open comes and then they're just churning millions of shares a minute. And, you know, the algorithm just slowly walks it up, walks it up, walks it up, walks it up. And those type of stocks, I don't want to fight manipulation. I'm kind of the point where if an algorithm is, just trying to jam something, trying to fight something. I just stay on the sideline, right? Let them have their fun, wait for it to break, and try to hit the backside of the move. So Why not buy it? Oh, you know, I, and I do. And then I'll make money on one and the other four, the algo will leave <laughs> something. And I'm like, damn it, now I got to sell my long and I have to go short the stock it down. So, you know, once in a while I do, I just, you know, my, my win loss ratio is very skewed going long on, on some of these algorithm stocks. So I just, so pre-market, I think the biggest thing I try to find out is what stock hopefully won't be all go, you know, like, you know, what stock is just being jammed by retail, right? Or message boards, because those are the ones I feel like they're going to fail the easiest. And, you know, I think my, my risk reward on those would be the highest. And that's really about it. Just wait, wait for the open and, you know, see what else maybe pops up on the gap scanner until then. Would you say that 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 strategy has kind of been constant for the last 15 years that you've been trading that it is 
Yeah, okay. pretty much. You know, and now again, I'm not looking at just what the biggest gainers are are the, on the gap scanners. You know, sometimes you'll have multiple day runners. Like what what moved big yesterday that may be close strong or the day before. Um, but again, it's taking the previous days or the previous few days biggest winners, biggest gappers, uh, along with today's biggest gappers, and then putting them on your watch list and kind of just watching them trade. That's it. You know. Um, and again, I trade really just off reading the chart. Price action and volume are my really only indicators. And again, you know, certain people say, you know, okay, let's say a stock closed at two bucks and pre-market it's up to four. And, I'll, you know, I'll have people question, you know, what level do you want to short it at? I'm like, I have no idea. You know, I wait for the open and just have to see how it trades. Maybe I'll short it 450. Maybe I'll short it at $8. You know, you don't know in this market how high stocks can go. You look at uh, TKAT, which was uh, was an NFT stock. You know, went from five to seventy-five in a week. You know, so I rarely ever have an exact level. of This is where I want to trade it. It's more off of, say, that the, the market is open. Here's the chart. I think it's breaking down, and that's where I want to enter. Right? It's not not just picking out a price and saying, you know, I want to short it here. So, so looking at looking at that way you're you're primarily looking for a backside move you're not yeah. scaling into absolutely okay yeah absolutely yeah looking for a backside move waiting for you know volume peak or you know an all go to exit or you know um enough shorts to cover whatever it is but yeah waiting for a backside of the move yeah absolutely has that changed based on what it was before i mean like I as I, I used to work with short sellers and right. it used to be that you scaled in on the way up do you think that that's changed in this market environment? You know, for me, I almost never scaled into the way. I mean, it's safe to scale on the way up, I think, if you are fighting retail traders, right? I think if you're fighting algorithms or you're fighting funds, I, I just think that's a, you know, I, 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 I scaled on the way up to Dries back in 2015. And I think I lost a million dollars in three days. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm never doing this again. I mean, right? right because. Right. You don't know how high these stocks are going to go. It's like right. PKAT. It's a great example. It went from five to seventy-five in a few days, and the stock I think was a great short at ten and fifteen, and a great short at twenty, <laughs> even right. better at thirty and forty. So you just have to. You get I mean, for up. me, I just think that the, the the odds are better in your favor if you be patient and wait for the backside. And you know, I mean, if you want to start with real tiny size, that's fine. But you know, that's just not the method that I, you know, I've, I've had success with. So I, I really don't. Of course, you yeah. look for the breakdown. Right. You know, you look for a blow off move, perhaps. Right. Exactly. Cool. So, how would you say? I mean, I kind of asked this question already with whether that strategy or that your approach, that process has changed over the years. Would you say that your overall strategy has changed? I know you said you started trading options now. That's certainly right. a change. Right. Um, how do you see how how have you seen it evolve since you started? Well, my my strategy, you know, on the short side is very similar. Finding garbage small cap companies that are being run up for no real news or no real change of the business, right? And waiting for them to peak and short them. Now, again, in this market, the last year I don't swing trade hardly, hardly ever. Um, I've gone, you know, my one strategy has changed. You know, especially in the later in 2020 late third quarter and all fourth quarters i just went long a ton of stock right it took sure. me several months to realize that but stocks only go up in 2020 i mean <laughs> any any stock out there it's like just buy it you're going to double your money in a few weeks right so i went sure. long a lot now i'm going long a lot, lot less but i do have a few longs and then yeah i mean somebody did teach me and kind of mentor me on options about five years ago um and that's kind of evolved and I've really grown with options. And now it's, you know, around half of my income, um, you know, which I love. It's a great other method, but again, it, it, it ties you to your computer more. So it's more, more work, but more, you know, more money. But uh, so, yeah, those are kind of, you know, my overall strategy is the same, but now I'm just kind of trading options, I guess. You'd say. So what do you like, what, what's different about options and, and what do you like about it that makes it different than equities? So, you know, the real thing with options, I don't buy options. I, I just sell options. Um, and it's similar to shorting. You can just say, okay, I'm going to bet that this stock isn't going to hit this certain level by next Friday or the Friday after that or the Friday after that. You're just betting that stocks aren't going to hit certain levels. And the majority of time, 90-something percent of the time, you're going to win and you're going to collect that premium. The other, you know, 5% of the time or maybe even less, 2% of the time, you can get your face ripped off like, like GameStop, <laughs> right? 
Right. I mean, right. if you're shorting calls on GameStop when it's at 50 bucks or 100 bucks and, and it goes to 500, you you could be completely wiped out and owe, owe your broker money. And I don't know if you, you've heard of, and options are something I never really talk about. I, I, don't, I don't really tweet about it or, or talk about it because I don't know if you've heard of like optionsellers.com. There was a guy who put out a video two to three years ago who um, he was a big option hedge fund, I think in Florida, and he was selling natural gas. I think 200 to 250 million dollar hedge fund he completely blew up all of his clients owed the broker money um wow so options are a great side strategy a lot of people buy them and that's fine you know um i sell them so i take the other side of the bet and like i said you know 90 something percent of the time you're going to make money the other few percent of the time you can get your face ripped off if you don't know what you're doing like viacom last week viacom was at a hundred dollars I think on Monday or Monday it was about nine mid nineties. By Friday it closed at, you know, mid forties. So if you're selling puts on that, if you'd have sold puts in the nineties for, you know, I don't know what they were going for, 20, 30 cents, by Friday they were over ten bucks. You you, you know, you can lose 10, 20, 30 times your money in a day or two. So uh, yeah, you really have to know what you're doing, you really have to be on it. So yeah. <laughs> Good lord. So Talk to me a little bit about the way that you manage your risk, you know, on a day to day basis. Like, how do you how do you talk talk about your uh, your position sizes, what you're willing to risk from your account overall account size and and how you approach that? I'm sure that's changed, too, over the years. Right. No, it has. And um, I have mixed and Wix and Wayne on this in, in 2020 and even 2021 position sizing where, you know, you know, you have a stock like SNDL, you know, which was a hot stock a couple months ago and their float was a billion dollars or, you know, float was, I'm sorry, a billion shares. And, you know, something like that, I had, you know, 250,000 shares short, something like that, um, because it's a bigger float. And, um, you know, your risk isn't that high compared to some of these other lower float stocks. So lately, though, I have found um, I almost enjoy playing um, less size more. Just because the moves that we're seeing in some of these stocks are so incredibly volatile that they're 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 difficult to time, and you know with the manipulation we've seen, we've even seen you know al algorithms run a stock, drop it on heavy volume to where you know it's a short seller. Hey, that's a signal. It's done. We have short sellers run in, they regroup it, and they squeeze it back up. So um, position sizing for me is less now than probably you know I, I like to I, I guess I should say. I like taking lower position sizes because you can get in and get out easier and faster. And we're seeing such wide moves in stocks that, you know, you can make, you know, tremendous amount of money just scalping them, right? Just scalping them, you know, um, I'll, I'll use TKAT as another example, scalping it from, you know, 70 down to 55, and then it bounces $15 and it drops another seven or $8, then it bounces. So um, it's, it's less stressful for me to trade less size. And I found out that, um, you know, I kind of enjoy it more. As far as risk, how much am I willing to risk? Um, I, I think it's so important every day. You know, I try to go into the market with a mentality of just hitting a base hit. Whatever amount of, whatever your goal is, whether it's hundred bucks, thousand bucks, ten thousand dollars, don't try to don't try to make a month's worth of money in one day. If I and I try to do that. There are days where I say, Oh my God, look at this setup, I'm gonna hammer it. And on those days, I usually don't do very well. I usually right. trade way too much size, have FOMO, enter stocks way too early. It stopped out when I shouldn't. Uh, and I found that I, I'll trade better if I go in every day, say, hey, all I'm going to try to do is hit my daily goal. If I hit more, it, it, that'll take care of itself. But I don't want to have these days where I try to hit, you know, I want to I go for one month of income and make this much money. And then, you know, then you lose a month of income. And then the next day, it's a snowball effect. I need to make that back. And I found that it's so important to just keep your head on straight where you're thinking clearly every day and not going for these massive, you know, if you don't go for massive wins, you shouldn't take massive losses and just keeping a steady mentality every single day. That's what I kind of like to do. Do you think that that, how, how do you think like your, your personal psychology plays into that? I heard you mention that you have a personal goal each day. Right. Like, like right. do you feel that, that can kind of like toy with how you're doing, even if you're actually yeah. making money, if you're not hitting your goal. Yeah. So I don't have an exact dollar amount. This is what I want. I kind of have a mental note. This is what I think I should make. This is an average for me. Right. So I take, 
my last year, your last couple months, this is what I made on average. And if I can make within 10, 20% on average, I'll be happy. My biggest thing now is I just like to be green every day. <laughs> if I can be green every day, honestly, even if the amounts are small, I'm happy. You know, I'm, I'm going home happy. Sure. Um, so I, I try not to get too fixated on a certain dollar amount, you know, as long as it's not red, right? As long as I'm not red, as long as I'm green, you know, I'm kind of happy. But, you know, for me, like I said, personally, I'll trade better if I just try to hit my daily goal and don't go for some massive, massive wins. And um, I even started, you know, now when I locate stocks, I used to, when I used to locate stocks in the morning, I'd say, oh, I need 100,000 shares of this and 70,000 shares of that, 50,000 shares of this, so you're, you're fully loaded. And now I do think borrows have gotten easier, but now I'll just go into a day and say, you know, unless, unless like I said, SNDL sometimes has a billion float, but and actually that was easy to borrow. But for the most part now, if I see a runner, I'm borrowing, you know, 20,000 shares, 30,000 shares, that's it. Trade that, and for some reason you need more, then you can go in and take more. But I have found that for me, it's just kind of a better, you know, it's a better mix right there, staying that, you know, middle ground or lower to mid position sizing than trying to go crazy every single day. How much do you think those, the, the other metrics that, like when you're researching a stock that you're planning to trade, you look at, obviously, the liquidity is really right. important, the shares outstanding, the float are all very important factors. But But in your mind, where does the buck stop? Like, what's the most important metric that you're looking at when you're trying to determine how to approach a trade? Recently, it honestly, it's a, if, if an algorithm is in the stock. You know, I found if an algo is trying to jam a stock, or again, you see a stock that has, you know, averages 10,000, you know, 100,000 shares a day, and all of a sudden one day it does 200 million shares. Well, that's not retail. That's not retail. It's not method board. Those are algorithms in there playing around. So the biggest metric I find is that out of the gappers I see is that, you know, are, is an algorithm going to target this stock? <laughs> because, you know, I found if they do, you're not going to win until they exit, right? I mean, they, they'll they just ramp a stock, let it dip, re-ramp it, let it dip, re-ramp it again, let it dip. And I think a lot of the psychology now, you know, that I try to think about is what cycle are we in with algorithms? And, and they definitely play games where for a week straight, they will rip your face off every day. They're just going to jam every stock, jam it, jam it, jam it, jam it. And then for a month, they'll disappear, you know, and, and then you got retail jamming stocks pre-market, you know, only to fade. That's where short sellers are just making lots of money because we're just, you know, kind of taking money from retail. Right. Um, right. So I, I think one of the biggest thought processes I have is that what kind of cycle are we in with algorithms and what do I think that they're going to try to do? And you just kind of have to try to outsmart them, which is, you know, kind of a difficult game. Talk to me about how you figure out whether an algo is involved. I mean, the, the obvious answer for an experienced trader would be like, oh, well, you can just tell. But right. what are you actually looking for? Like, like, take me into your process for that. The biggest thing is, is volume. You know, when, when that stock opens up, if you're churning a million shares a minute, that's an algorithm, right? I mean, for the most part. Now, again... We have seen right now, re there's so many retail traders out there, right? All these brokerage accounts are opening up record amounts of new accounts every month, hundreds of thousands of accounts a month, and people are working from home and people love it. So there's a lot of retail action. So even if volume is high pre-market and into the open, usually after the first 30 minutes, I think you can kind of tell if the volume is an algo volume or if it's just retail volume. So for me, the biggest indicator is, is volume. I mean, that's probably about it. Um, and the history of the stock. I mean, again, I think we've seen where algos target specific symbols. You know, they've done that multiple times. So, yeah, it's it's not an easy process. I mean, there's a lot of small losses I take from algos all the time. I mean, it's not like, sure. oh, I have this system figured out. This is how you beat them. You just have to, uh, you know, kind of keep fighting, fighting them, keep, you know, keep at them and, um you know, and I would say, again, in this market, too, I probably take profits quicker than I used to in the past where, you know, you're scalping a lot more. Right. Because we've seen stocks, too, where they'll ramp in the morning, fall hard for an hour or two, and then maybe they could re-ramp back up in the afternoon. So you constantly have to adapt and change. But, you know, the nice thing about the market is you can pull up. We have runners of the stock market every single day. You can pull up. Last week's charts on Friday, how do they trade? Last week's runners on Thursday, last week's runners on Wednesday. So anybody go out there and study, pull up the charts, see how they trade, see the volume, 
see when they break? Was there a signal when the stock broke? What time of the day did it break? What was the volume when it broke? So I think, you know, for the average trader, you know, they can, you can just study it. That's what it takes, studying it, right? Looking at the data and study it and not try to find shortcuts, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. What about technical indicators? Are there any that, that you really like or are you like just a price and volume guy? Strictly price and volume. BWAP a little bit, you know, but yeah, really just price and volume. That's all. That, that's how I started trading. That's all I really studied for years. And then after I got into trading, it's like, oh, there's all these other indicators. But since I had looked at tens of thousands of charts when I, in my younger days, of just price and just volume, then I'm kind of set on my, set my ways that that's what I like and that's what I kind of stick with, you know. Do you do a lot of technical analysis yourself, like, you know, drawing lines and looking for double bottoms, all that kind of stuff like the. Yeah, I don't draw any extra. It's all mental. You know, I just look <laughs> at the chart myself. So I mentalize it. That's it. I don't draw anything or do anything else. Nope. Nothing, nothing special like that at all. Now do you use OHLC or candlesticks? Which, which type of chart do you prefer? Oh yeah. Candlestick chart. That's about it. Yeah. Candlestick. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So looking back over the, over 15 years, obviously we've talked about how your strategy has changed a little bit. You brought options in. If you could think of a person, an entity that's had the greatest influence on your trading career, who would you credit with that? Um, you know, it's hard to say, you know, for equities, I don't think anybody, you know, I, you know, equities, I've sweated out. I mean, I've learned from my mistakes. Trust me, I have thousands of, and I, you know, um, everything I've really learned in equities outside of me, I mean, I would say 95% of what I've learned from the short side has been kind of through myself through trial and error. And then you pick up little tidbits from this guy who reads filings really well. He said, this is what you look for. Or this guy who knows, you know, short locates or buy-ins or whatever. Um, but, you know, from the shorting side, you know, again, everything I know is really self-taught. I mean, if I had to pick one guy, I'd be the guy that taught me options because he completely opened up another world of income and another world of trading and another world of fun, you know, for me to trade. <laughs> because before that, I had tried to learn options and options are complex. I mean, they're, they're difficult to understand. They're difficult because most of what you read on options is you buy, right? You buy options and hope stock jams. Well, you know, 90 something percent of all options require work. I don't know, stats, something like that. So you know, to me, you know, the method I learned of shorting options or selling options, uh, you know, I love. So I probably credit the, the mentor that I had that taught me options more than anybody. Very nice. So taking a step away from trading, you've obviously achieved great success uh, as a trader. Longer term investments. Right. I, uh, I understand that you are a fan of real estate. I am. So what what? How did that come about? How did you figure it out? What what made you decide to, to uh, dip your toe in there? So, you know, first, I think it's a great idea for traders to have a side investment, a side plan, a backup plan, whatever it is, have money outside the market that they have working for themselves because you never know when that one trade could, you know, end your career or you never know when you just burnt out and don't want to do it anymore, right? So I was interested in real estate at a young age, like in my... 20, like 2021, 20, and I started buying rental properties and, um, you know, just managing rental properties or multifamily properties and uh, maybe flipping a property or two. But then I found that, you know, in real estate itself, or as far as, you know, single family or, or rental properties, that takes a lot. That takes a lot of focus and time and energy and leaky roofs and bad tenants and evictions and, you know, all this crap. So, you know, even if you have a property manager, it's a lot to take care of. So, my father-in-law, who owns a, a lot of farmland in Illinois, got me started buying um, just fillable farm ground in Missouri. And we, we've been buying farmland in Missouri for about five years now. And um, we've got close to 3,000 acres of just fillable farmland. And it, it's farmland, you know, it's probably one of the most boring investments out there, right? You're just <laughs> buying, I mean, really, all you're doing is buying flat piece of dirt where a farmer grows and grows corn or grows soybeans or grows, you know, wheat or whatever it is. But you know, the last 50 years or so in the Midwest returns, or you're going to make six to 7% a year in your land. You're going to make four to 5% cash rent for the farm, you know, from the farmers. So you're going to make an average of 10, 11%, um, which is about historically what the market's going to provide you. The reason I like land is that, you know, number one, you know, what's crazy about the stock market is I can take my mouse and with a few clicks, 
buy or sell or risk millions of dollars, right? Sure. At your fingertips. So land I love because I can't screw it up, right? I can't ma I can't have a bad night's sleep and say, man, I'm gonna go and you know, you know, lose millions of dollars in a day in my computer. I can't do it. So I'm gonna go burn I'm gonna burn this sugar cane. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so the money is out of my hands. It's in land and and if I have a piece of land that's worth a million dollars today, it's gonna be worth a million dollars tomorrow. Hopefully right. in 10 years, it's going to be worth 2 million or 3 million. And, you know, think about farmland. Now I read that Bill Gates is the biggest owner of farmland in the, uh, in the United States, or maybe it's probably the world. And the government subsidizes farming. You know, I'm not trying to make a commercial for farmland. This is why I like it. You know, the government subsidizes it. The government will not let farmers fail. You know, population is going up. You know, unfortunately, you know, starvation rates are at all time highs. You know, there's not enough food to feed people. Right. Um, you have urban sprawl, right? People, they don't want to live right on top of their neighbors anymore. They want one acre or five acres or 10 acres. Well, guess what? Where are they taking that land? They're taking that land. They're taking farmland. So there's less farmland. Commodities are high. So I'm bullish on farmland. I love it. I have to do nothing. I, I collect one check a year in the spring. Uh, the farmer does everything else, takes out insurance and risk. If, if the farm floods, doesn't really affect me. If there's a drought, doesn't really affect me. The, the government backs them, right? And I sit back and I have a I have a backup plan and I have income, and uh, I love it. Yeah. And again, it doesn't matter what your method is. Whether it's farmland, whether it's real estate, whether it's even just long term stocks, bonds, mutual funds, CDs, or investing in other businesses. It's so, I I just love the fact of diversifying away from the market because, you know, I think there's always a day where either you don't want to work anymore or you blow up or whatever and have that side nest egg is just so important. I've seen so many people that have every penny in the market and that, you know, and then next week, you know, it's gone, you know, so that's, that's just a risky, risky endeavor. So is, would you say that all of your longer term um, investments are primarily in real estate or do you have other more traditional uh, investment so avenues? I do, that I do 401k. That's the nice thing about, day trading self-employed, you know, we have a 401k. So I do a lot of, uh, and then just a taxable account as well. So I manage, you know, long-term mutual funds and CDF, not, not CDF, uh, but mutual funds, ETFs, uh, bonds. So I have that. And again, if you look at the market, you know, I think the market's high. I'm not a market timer at all, but, you know, people thought the market was high in 2010 and 2015 and 2020. And it just, where's it go? It just keeps going high and the Fed keeps pumping money in and there's more stimulus. So, it's hard to bet against the market. So I do sure. have long term investments. Um, and when I don't manage those investments, they do way better. You know, if I just buy my mutual funds and ETFs and don't even look at them, they do great. Right. I screw them up when I try to say, okay, I think the market's going to go down. You know, it fell yesterday. I think it's going to go down. Let me sell. And guess what? The very next day, it's 500. So for me, I almost am best at my longer term stuff, buying the whatever you want to buy and locking myself out and saying once a year, remanage it. But yeah, I would say 75% of our longer term assets are in real estate land. And then the other 20, 25% in the market. Yeah. Got it. In thinking about your career and, and mm -hmm. all the success that you've achieved, what's your feeling on the old adage, like without great risk, there's no great reward. Do you feel like you can grind this business out and become immensely successful without feeling like you're putting your balls on the table, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think so. It's again, what do you want? What do you, what's the definition of great reward? Is it, you know, hundreds of millions or, you know, is it just <laughs> tens of millions, you know? So yeah, no, I, I feel like the day trading, my day trading money, I think is fairly low risk, especially now that I don't swing it overnight. It's just, it takes a, time and effort and dedication to figure out and to get to that point of making it low risk, right? So I think if you put in that time, you know, you can make it low risk, but obviously the more risk you have and the more risk you put on, the more reward you should make. But you get to a point in your career where you don't want the risk anymore. Like I don't need to make, you know, what I made in 2020, I don't need to make it ever again. What I don't want to do is do something stupid and lose 50% of my net worth, right? So my mentality now is really switching more to making less, which I'm fine with, but risking less. You know, I'm, sure. I'm, I'll be 37 in a week, which I, you know, 
mentally there's times in the market where I feel like I'm 57, but uh, there's times where it's like, I don't need to make tons of money, but I don't want to put this chunk at risk, right? I don't sure. want to lose it anymore. When I was early 20s or mid 20s or even a few years ago, you know, shit, it's like, you know, if I blow up, I blow up, you know, but now, you know, you get older, you have wife, you have kids, you have family, and yeah, there's one day you want to retire and, and be done with the market. So, you know, your, your, your vision of risk is different, right? Um, you just don't want to take on that heavy risk anymore. So was trading for you a means to an end, like as far as like the way that you view the financial aspect, or do you, I mean, just go into the question that I ask everybody in the show. Like, what is it that actually drives you to get up in the morning? Like, are you very money motivated or do you love the art of trading? What, what is it that uh, powers you? Oh, uh, so I would say money motivated me all the way up until, you know, almost 2020, at the end of 2020, when I realized I, I really don't even have to work if I don't anymore. And now it's just, it's a love of the market, you know, because even though I'm, you know, on Fridays, I'm like, oh my God, I'm stressed. I need a beer. I'm tired. Don't even, I'm turning my phone off, turning my computer off. But by Sunday night, it's like, okay, you know, what am I going to do? Like I've had two days off. Yeah. I want to trade tomorrow. So, um, you know, I love the markets and I'm addicted to the markets. And I think I always will be, you know, my, sort of plan would be to once the market settles down um which you know part of me hopes it's never part of me hopes it's like really soon to just want to <laughs> work you know the first go back to what i've done in the past work the first couple hours and then take off right you know if, even if i can make 60 percent of what i would work in all day if i can do that in an hour or two or 50 percent then I'd, I'd be happier doing that because there's also a, a stress factor of the market. You know, I'm going to go back to options really quick and GameStop, you know, and I had a few options overnight with GameStop. Luckily I was very well hedged. So it didn't hurt me that bad, but there was, I think two different nights with GameStop where I never slept at all. I stood up, I, 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 I my brain wouldn't let me go. I, I stayed up all night and I've had several of those in my career where it's a sleepless night. You have, you know, you had too much risk on overnight or too much on the table and you don't know what's going to happen. And you get to the point mentally where it's like, you know, I don't, I don't enjoy those nights and I definitely don't enjoy that next day. So what can I do to hopefully, you know, slowly eliminate those and uh, have a more peaceful life? <laughs> you know, because the market, you know, it's, it's stressful. It, 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 it can, you know, it can turn your hair gray pretty early. So, sure. Yeah. So if, if, if you had a check right now for a billion dollars, yeah. never had to work another day in your life, what is it that you would do? What's your, what's your true passion? Uh, you know, again, if, even if I had unlimited money, I would still probably look at the market almost every day, just for an hour, see what the markets are doing, play fun money, and then I would manage more real estate, you know, manage more real estate, go down to my farms more often. We have a recreation farm and we're building on it. I'd probably enjoy that more, hunting and fishing. I love coaching all my kids' sports. I coach even my daughter's softball and all this stuff. So I coach, you know, I coach everything. So for me, it'd be to work a little bit in the market, a little bit real estate and then just take off and enjoy life in dabble in, dabble in the appliance business at all no that's no those are that's done no 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 not, nothing to do with that no <laughs> no places whatsoever <laughs> uh but i don't know you know just i'm actually the cheapest guy in the world you know we live on three acres here in st louis and guess who takes care of all the landscape for me you know, i mow the grass i remote i help my wife with planting flowers. So I, I, I do all that stuff and I actually enjoy it. I rake leaves, you know, I'll spend days blowing leaves in the fall. So I enjoy manual labor more than I do standing in front of my monitor. So I would just, you know, do more stuff like that. Very nice. Yeah. Well, that's all I got for you, man. I appreciate you coming on and, and being a part of the show and, uh, and for all of your support over the years, Traders for a Cause is so grateful. You've been an incredible asset to our success. So, uh, Thank you for doing the podcast. It was and... awesome, Zach. I really enjoyed it. And I am super happy about the day we can get back in person and, and, and uh, redo the conferences. Because, Let me tell you, uh, we're the working on conferences it. conferences are great. I love them. But the in-person can't be matched, right? To, to do it in person, meet everybody, talk to everybody. It's something I look forward to every year. So I, I am super pumped about getting back whenever that is. <laughs> we're, we're working on it. Uh, really, it's a matter of uh, hotel liability and you know, right. how comfortable are we getting into a contract situation? But we are working on getting sure. back to Vegas and I'm getting a lot of people that are dying to get back <laughs> to Vegas. I so. am too, man. I'm first one to sign up when, when it's there. 
Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Again, Phil. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. In the meantime, trade, profit, and make a difference. Take care. Because I see your, what? I see your pictures on the beach, and I'm like, that's oh, that's Florida? that's the dad bod that I'm going for. <laughs> you know, so like, these are the books I have on my desk now. Eat better, feel better. Is that Giada? Oh, <laughs> Giada, I'm reading all this crap. <laughs>